Hello everyone, I am Siddhartham. This is the 7th deep learning project video in my YouTube channel and in this video let's understand how we can build a plant disease prediction system where we will be training a convolutional neural network for image classification. Once we have trained this model, we will build a simple streamlit web app where the user can upload a plant image and predict with this trained model about what that particular plant disease is. Once we have this streamlit app, we will dockerize this streamlit app and deploy it as a docker container for better standards. So before going into the workflow for this use case, I'll just quickly show you how this streamlit web app looks like. So this is the page of our streamlit web app where the user can browse and paste the files from their local system and have some uh, basic test files for this. The first one is like uh, blueberry LT. So if the model is predicting correctly, once I uh, click this classify button, it should say it is like a blueberry LT one. So just for reference, I have named the file with the same class name, which is blueberry LT. And this is like a test image. So I'll classify this. And here we are seeing the prediction as blueberry LT. So I'll also paste another uh, image, which is for this potato early blight. So we will also display this image here, as you can see, and uh, we can classify it. So this is how you would get a prediction. So this is like the end product of what we are uh, trying to build. And before getting into the coding aspects, let's quickly uh, understand the workflow for this use case. The first uh, thing that we will be doing is data curation. So we know that this is an image classification uh, model that we are going to build. So we need a proper image data for this. And in this case, we have a Kaggle data set that we will be using. So I'll also show you how you can get the Kaggle JSON file uh, which basically contains your Kaggle account credentials and kind of load it in Python and get this data set through a API. Okay, so I will be working on Google Collaboratory. So you can try that or even you can work on your Jupyter Notebook as well. So once we have our image data set, the next step will be data processing. So in this data processing step, we will work with a image data generator uh, class from TensorFlow where we will kind of load this uh, image data from the directory with appropriate classes and make it uh, kind of suitable for the neural network to learn from it so here we will understand like quite good amount of data processing steps so once the data processing step is done we will split our data set into training data and test data so this is actually connected to the data processing step where we will kind of build a pipeline for training data generator and other one is for like validation generator so this both of these kind of will be interlinked with the image data generator uh, method that we will be using so once we have our training data and test data, we will build our convolutional neural network with appropriate convolutional layers and all the dense layer required. And once we train this model, we will evaluate and make sure that it is like working well and it has like a decent accuracy. So once all these are done, we will save this model as a file. And once this model has been saved, we can kind of build a streamlit web app around this where we will kind of export this uh, trained file and load it in the streamlit web app python script where again the one that i've showed you where the user can upload an image and get a prediction so once all these are done the next step is dockerizing this so the first step of dockerizing this streamlit web app is creating a docker file that has the list of instructions to build a docker image so once we have this docker file, we will build a docker image and once the docker image has been built, we will kind of uh, create docker containers out of this. So even if you want, you can kind of push this to uh, some docker repository like docker hub or you can probably put it on um, Azure or AWS like container registries. So but we won't be discussing that we have already made videos on that. So in this video, let's just build this streamlet app and kind of build this docker images. So for the first step, I'll show you how to train this model and kind of uh, process this data and this is the data set link so i'll give this uh, link in this video description or probably i'll also give you this repository that i have created so i'll also give the link of that data set but you actually don't need it but if you want to go through about the data set you can go through this because uh, i'll be using the api command that we have over here so we will directly import this uh, data set in the uh, uh, google collaboratory environment that we are working on so the first step is make sure that you are connecting to 
GPU environment so that your training happens quickly. So I'll connect my system so you can see the connection status over here. And the first thing that you need is in order to load this data from Kaggle, you need a Kaggle.json file. Again, as I said, it is basically the file that contains the credentials for your Kaggle account that lets you use these Kaggle APIs in order to import your data. So in order to get that, what you can do is uh, make sure that you have uh, signed up in Kaggle and also right uh, you need to verify your mail id and phone number so in some cases the apis are not working if i mean if you are like not kind of verifying your uh, you know credentials properly in kaggle account so make sure that you have done that properly and uh, in the top right corner you will see this account icon so you can go there and go to this profile section yeah so profile probably i think you can go to settings and then you will have this account section yeah right so go to the top right corner go to settings and this will open this page and here in this apa section you will uh, see this apa section where we have this create new token so give this and this will download a kaggle.json file so i have already downloaded my json file so once that is done right so you need to upload this file over here so come to these files and upload your kaggle.json so i have this in my downloads so i'll scroll down and i'll upload this kaggle.json file so this basically contains uh two key value pairs one is your kaggle account username and other one is your like kpa key so previously we we would have configured this file but there is another easy way to do this where we will just kind of load these credentials into environment variables and from there kaggle can pick it up okay so let's understand the next step so the first thing that i'm doing is seeding uh, the libraries that we have so we have this random library numpy library and i'm importing this tensorflow library so all these are like uh, pre-installed in google collaboratory and if you are working on jupyter notebook on your local pc right so make sure that you have installed all these libraries with pip install or with uh, conda navigator you can do with this and the first step is i'm seeding this again for reproducibility this is because in a lot of the steps that we are working on internally some random process happens so think about it as let's say we are uh, building a neural network and it has to train right so when a neural network trains it randomly kind of uh, generates its its parameter value which is its initial value so there is some kind of randomness involved in it so each time you run this code each time it may give you slightly different results so if you don't want that we need to kind of uh, set all these random process in such a way that each time I mention this seed, the same uh, output is what I'm getting. So this is just to make sure that when I'm doing some experiments, all the results that I'm getting are kind of consistent and it is not varying. So that's why we have this seed. So this is just similar to the random state that we have in train test script. So you can kind of think about that, where if you have a same uh, random state, your data is going to be split in the same way, right? So it's, it's kind of similar to that. First, we are importing this random library and seeding it with uh, the value zero. And then I am importing this numpy library and again seeding it with zero. And TensorFlow is also I'm seeding it with zero. So if you are seeding it with the same values, you will uh, get like the same results that I am getting as well, right? So I'll run this cell. The next step is importing the required uh, dependencies. So I have this OS library in order to access some files and I have this JSON library in order to load my Kaggle.json file. And once we uh, call this Kaggle API, we will get the data set in a zip file and we need to export it. Sorry, we need to extract it. And for this, we'll be using this zip file class in the zip file library. So this is also like pre-installed. So you don't have to do that. Next one is pillow library is used to do some image processing works. And then we have, of course, the main NumPy library, matplotlib in order to plot some results on the image. Again, MP image, matplotlib.image is used to kind of load and uh, kind of display an image and then we have tensorflow.keras.preprocessing.image we have this image data generator and this is like the data pipelines that we will set for training data and testing data and then finally we have from tensorflow.keras we have this layers and models so uh, layers is basically used to have all the layers such as convolutional layers flattening and uh, you know the uh, dense layers that we need for our neural network and models is basically we will uh, import our sequential from these models so these are the required dependencies so i'll run this next step is data curation so make sure that you have uploaded your kaggle.json file that you got from here and the next step is getting this uh, kaggle api command so come back to this uh, data set link now uh, 
you can run this pip install in your local Jupyter to make sure that Kaggle library is installed. Again, this is pre-installed in Google Collaboratory, so you don't have to worry about that. Next step is I'm opening this Kaggle.json file with a JSON library, json.load open Kaggle.json, and I'm storing it in a dictionary called as Kaggle credentials. So this will basically create a dictionary and I'm storing it in this variable called as Kaggle credentials. So this Kaggle.json contains two key value pairs. One is username, and the other one is key so that we are storing it as kaggle username and kaggle key in our uh environment variables so i mean the easy way would be to kind of copy the username and key and paste it here but that's not like a good standard because you don't want your passwords or your api keys to be present explicitly in your code so what we can do is kind of uh, have a file like this and then load it in our environment variables which is like a more standard way so so that you can probably like share your code without like uh, uh, you know you don't have to share those username and passwords for your account so that's why we use this so i'll run this kaggle credentials thing and i'll run this where we are kind of setting up the environment variables with the credentials this is the api command so i'll go here uh, you can see this options in this uh, data set page so you can go to this options and copy this api command so this is the command that i have pasted here make sure that you are putting exclamatory mark so because this is like kind of running as a command so you just have to run this so this is the same command so i'll run this so this will basically download a zip file and it will store it in our files so again you can do this in your local system as well in jupyter notebook so you can see that uh, the total size is about 2.04 gigahertz and it's kind of downloading it so once it's done right i can run this uh, ls which basically lists all the files in your working directory to make sure that our data set is present right so this has downloaded it so this is our kaggle.json file this is the sample data is like the default folder that you have in google collab and this plant village iphone dataset.zip is the file that we need so you can also see this here so i've uh, pasted this uh, file name here so if you want you can also paste like the complete path of this file so we have this with zip file uh, the name of the file and we are reading it as the zip ref and we are extracting the entire content of this zip file so this will extract and this will also be saved in this working directory so you can see here we have the folder called as plant village data set okay so probably let's wait for uh, this file to be extracted so this is the base directory where we have this plant village data set as you can see here and this has other sub directories right so this has like a folder called a segmented color and grayscale so basically grayscale contains all these three subfolders contains the same data set same images but the difference is all the image files in this grayscale folder are present in grayscale black and white images and color are rgb images and the segmented ones kind of doesn't have any background so it just have the leaf images uh, that we'll be working on so for our use case we'll be working on colored images if you want you can also probably use grayscale the only reason that i'm going with color is with this plant infection right it it can be a factor that the color that we are seeing in the image may kind of uh, give the model an idea of this is what that particular disease is so that's the reason so you can see this over here so i'll explain expand this plant village data set so here we are seeing this color grayscale and segmented so i'll uh, go ahead and again open this and you can see all the subfolders again and these are the individual uh, diseases that we will predict so these are basically the class names that are present as individual subfolders within this color right so we won't be using this grayscale and segmented for now but you can try it out with these set of images as well so in this color you can see again all these individual classes if i open this i will see like all the images that that's kind of present here so i can double click here to open this image here so you can see uh, the image sorry the leaf image with some dots right so i'll close this probably i'll open the one apple with healthy images so we will also need to understand how many classes are present within this uh, folder so you can see here we don't have any dots or uh, kind of some uh, markings that suggest that some infection is present right so this is for apple lilti so similarly we have for different plant and different diseases of those plants right so this is about this data set so i'll probably collapse this for now so that's what i wanted to see first i'm printing the uh, you know basically the sub directories in this plant village data set and then i'm printing uh, the length of 
segmented basically to see how many subfolders are there in each of this right so i'll run this one right so you can see uh, this is the output of the first line which is how many or basically what are all the subdirectories in this plant village data set and this we already know so it has grayscale segmented and color now i want to know what are all the number of you know directories subdirectories that we have in the segmented color and grayscale so we are basically this os.list directory right so this will basically return you a list that contains all the subdirectories of a particular directory so if i call this os.list uh, directory of this color right so it will uh, kind of get all the names of the subdirectories in this color fold color folder and create a list out of this right and i'm printing the length of that particular list and i'm printing the first five names of that list so i'll run this so here you can see it says 38 that means we have 38 different uh, diseases so that's belonging to different plants like apple tomato potato and so on right so similarly for grayscale and segmented we have like these many numbers so that's what i have printed here so the number of classes that we have over here is 38 so it's, it's basically a multi-class classification problem where we have like basically more than two classes right and as i said this i'm just printing just to see like in this grape elt right how many files individual files are there so we know that these are all the class folders and within each of these class folders right so we have individual images so i'll uh, run this so this particular folder contains 423 images and these are all the names of these images right so uh, I didn't check like the individual numbers of all these folders probably you can do like check for some of these folders to make sure that the data is like evenly distributed and so on right so that is the next step so these are the number of images now let's take this color folder and try to do some pre-processing out of this so I'm creating a variable called as base directory and I'm passing the path of this uh, uh, data set that we have which is plant village data set slash color right this is what we'll be using later the next step is i just want to let's say uh, plot and see how this image is looking like so i have kind of chosen an image from this uh, folder and i'm going to do this you can also like uh, go through this folder and print like some other image as well so this is the particular image that i'm taking in this image path and uh, we have this mp img right that we have imported from matplotlib uh, dot image as mp img so using that we are going to plot it so we know that this is a colored image so we will do that and we will also check what's the shape of this image and then we are like uh, showing this image and saying axis is off so if you don't do that right so you will see that pixel number is the axis number so i don't want that so i'm turning off these axes and saying plt dot show so before that i'll run this as well so this base directory we will use a bit later so you can see the image so this is the image and we see that the size the shape is 256 256 and 3 so i'm sure that all the images are of like this same shape so that's other thing right so you need to make sure that all the training images and the test images that you're working on are of the same shape so you can't have images of different shape and train a model so this has to be uniform so yeah you if you want you can again print some other image and see how this looks like and this three represents it's a colored image right because uh, this is basically your channel information so three means we have three channels that are red green and blue which are the rgb channels and if you have grayscale you wouldn't see any value here that means there is one channel which is uh, black and white right the basically it's the intensity of your white color where in this case it's like for colored image you have like three matrices where the first matrix would corresponds to the intensity of red color and the next uh, let's say uh, green matrix matrix is like the intensity of green and similarly you have the blue intensity value and when you combine all this you would like get all the colors that you have so that's like the idea behind the rgb image and then we have this image parameters so i'm going to uh, resize all these images to 224 comma 224 basically the height uh, as 224 pixel and your width as 224 pixel because this is one of the widely used uh, parameter that's because like your image is basically like a bit large enough to capture all the features and it, it's also not like that big so that it's it's also not memory wise it's not like that intensive so this is like a usual uh, kind of size that we can go with but again it's, it's not uh, bad if you want to go with 256 comma 256 but make sure that you use that here so that even if some images are of different shape right so we will resize this later 
so that's uh, the purpose basically and then uh, we have this image size and the batch size over here and then we have this data generator so for this data generator we will be using this image data generator so that we have imported from tensorflow keras preprocessing dot image image data generator and here i'm specifying that uh, my uh, rescale is equal to one comma two double five right so the purpose here is uh, you can kind of print this particular uh, image values or you can basically load it as a numpy array and see those values probably i can do it with this itself so i'll show you and i'll print this image so these are all all the pixel uh, basically the intensity values so you can see the values are 179 173 79 and so on so this value ranges from 0 to 255 uh, which is basically those intensity values for grayscale also it's same zero means it's black white uh, 255 means it's like highest intensity which is basically your white color similarly you have all these uh, values for your rgb channels individually as well right so your range of values starts from zero and it's kind of like ends with 255 so you can kind of train your neural network with this particular values as well but it's not that good because uh what we usually do is we rescale this in such a way that all the values are between 0 and 1 so by that way right so the range that you are working on is pretty less so it's uh, memory wise it's like less intensive again and also it helps your model to converge kind of quickly so we kind of used uh stochastic gradient kind of uh, optimizer right and uh, if you don't kind of rescale this to this zero one range what would happen is that some pixel values are of like you know higher range of uh, hundreds and some pixel values are in the range of let's say 10 and 20s and so on and at each iteration your gradient to change which is basically your loss function with respect to the weights and parameters that you are considering so if the range is more then the change of these gradients are not so smooth so what would happen is like your model may not have like a smooth performance uh, or basically your optimizer may not work smoothly and it may not like converge at the global minimum so you would kind of uh, stuck in some local minimum and there are like a lot of disadvantages there so we would like uh, kind of rescale this value or what we call this as basically like normalization where we are normalizing the values between 0 and 1 so there are like more things to it which we will probably discuss more in detail when we kind of continue our deep learning series but for now we can just have this idea of it's basically better when you have this normalized uh, images where the pixel values are between 0 and 1 right so that's what we are mentioning in this image data generator as the scale of 1 divided by 255 and validation split of 0 0.2 so what i'm doing here is i'm reserving some image for validation or basically for my test data so when i have this training data generator and test data generator 80 percentage of percentage of images will be kind of considered as training image and 20 percent will be considered for testing image just like your train test split right and the other thing is you can do this separately as well so here we are kind of building a pipeline uh, and kind of working with it with a batch wise way uh, the other way is you can kind of write a for loop and load all these images individually resize it apply this rescaling and so on so you can do that as well but what would happen is in in the way where we are having a for loop right all these images will be loaded together in your memory and that will like Kind of uh, probably crash your uh, collapse session or it's, it's not ideal right because what this data generator do is it will process your images in batch so that you don't have that many number of images at a moment in your memory in your ram so it, it kind of works more efficiently with your memory as well so that's the other thing so considering uh, your memory intensity and and the workload on your cpu and memory is like very crucial when you're working with the deep learning as well so that's the other thing that we need to consider so in this case we are just like mentioning the rescale value so where we are just dividing it by with the maximum value right so what would happen is the max value is 255 so when you divide 250 by by 255 you would get one and when you divide the lower value which is 0 by 255 you will get 0 so all the values will lie in between so the end result is that all the pixel value between 0 and 255 so that's the idea and there are like other things to this we are just doing two things right there are other things such as data augmentation where we can augment our training data so we usually don't augment our test data so data augmentation is is just to kind of add 
like uh, more number of training data points and this is also helpful to make sure that your model is not overfitting so what would basically happen in data augmentation is that once we have an image we kind of flip it rotate it so that it's kind of like add more to your training data and it kind of generalize your model so that it doesn't overfit so if you want you can basically like do those as well so you have like uh, kind of parameters that you can mention in order to say that i want to rotate this images by this degree so um, this will basically again increase your training data so this is my uh, base data generator so that i'm storing it as in this data gen variable and then i have this train data generator and validation generator so these are all the things that would happen in my training generator these are all the things that should happen in my validation generator so i'm calling this data gen instance so this data gen is an instance of this image data generator which has this uh, parameters of rescaling and validation so i'm calling this flow from directory the other interesting and very useful technique about this right you don't have to kind of say that these are all the class names this is how my or, or basically you don't have to kind of uh, label your images what this will do is this flow from directory thing that we have right so this will recognize that your data is present in these subfolders and all these are individual classes so all this like will kind of pick it, it will pick it up from this flow from directory thing so all the labels are kind of like properly passed on to the model like after applying this one not encoding and all this thing so you don't have to worry about kind of having your uh, you know your your target variable y and all those things so your x and y all these things will be splitted in appropriate way required for the model so this is basically like a better efficient way to kind of process your data in pipelines so you have this data gen flow from directory and this is where we are passing our base directory which is our uh, plant village data set color right so this is where uh, why we have this base directory so you can do this with any data set but make sure that you have a main directory and within that main directory you have like all the classes kind of in a folder right so uh, you have all the images now what would happen ideally in this case is right so you have all the images all these images will be tagged to the class apple underscore apple scap so similarly all the images in this black rot will have a label as apple black rot and so on so and then you can extract the label names from this generator as well so that will also will be doing that we can see later so we are passing this base directory that contains all the subdirectories of classes and the images for that and then we are mentioning the target size as image size this image size is the target size that we have mentioned which is 224 so when you have this image size comma image it's basically that saying that i want 224 comma 224 as my height and width so that's what we are seeing here so your resizing will happen here so even if you have uh, some other shape right so it will be resized in such a way that all the images are of this same shape and here i'm mentioning the batch size so batch size is another crucial thing uh, you can kind of like increase this batch size if you have if you have access to a larger memory larger ram so this is uh, this 32 is nothing but we kind of train our neural network by passing the images in batch and this 32 basically represent that each batch has 32 images and once uh, kind of the model looks at all the images in this batch right after that it will kind of update its parameter so your optimizers would work so this is like the importance of batch again uh, increasing your batch number would speed up the process of training but again it's like a memory intensive process so make sure that you have more ram if you are kind of increasing this batch size so you can are you can kind of do some trial and error to see that what's the proper size batch size for your data set and for your machine so that's okay you don't have to go with the number that i'm mentioning here right so that's <clears throat> the other thing so we usually go with 32 64 just multiply it by 2 32 64 uh, 120 256 so these are some of the batch sizes that we would kind of work with so that's what we have over here and we are saying that subset is equal to training so when i say subset is training it will kind of uh, look at the images that uh, we kind of reserved for training so when you say validation split of uh, 0.2 which is 20 percent 80 percentage is reserved for training so that's what will be flowing to the strain generator and then class mode we are saying it's categorical so similarly we are doing the same thing for validation generator where all these steps should uh, kind of work here the other thing that you could probably include in training generator is basically your augmentation step or other processing or other things that you want to do to your training but yeah you don't have to do the augmentation one test so these are the two things that we have over here 
so this validation right now this will look at those 20 percentage kind of result for validation of your testing data and it will like kind of take it and work on it right and then you have this class mode as categorical as well uh, right so on the other thing is you can also initially as well you can segregate some amount of data as your global test set so that that data is not present in your training as well as validation so once you are like what we are doing is right so your training data acts as your basically the data on which your model trains and based on validation it we understand how the model is performing but in order to get a better idea you can probably have a global test set which the model has never seen even for let's say the validation and that will act as your final final kind of uh, data set that acts as the benchmarking data set for your model so you can kind of set some global data set separately as well so this is for the data processing step so these will take care of all those uh, trained to spread data processing and so on so which kind of makes things much easier for us so i'll run these steps right so you can see for the training we have 43456 images belonging to 38 classes and 10849 for those other 38 classes the test images now let's build a simple convolutional neural network so as these are some initial uh, use cases that i'm that we are working on i'm just keeping things simple so i haven't kind of went with like more complex model but once we kind of move on to other use cases right so i'll try to include more complex architecture and, and probably like uh, other pre-trained uh, models that we can use for transfer learning but for now let's just stick to simple architecture to just understand the flow better okay so here uh, we have this variable called as model and we are kind of initiating a sequential model so this sequential we have imported it from tensorflow keras dot models this is where you can see so tensorflow dot keras import layers and models so this models have this sequential class which will be using and layers contains all those uh, your convolutional layers max pooling layers and so on so we have this models dot sequential so sequential we basically use when we have a linear stack of layers so it's like you have layers kind of stacked upon uh, one another in a linear way where like each layer kind of get a tensor as input and it kind of sends out another tensor as output so for image classification this is like a, a good approach to use like a sequential uh, layer sorry the sequential uh, kind of a model so to the sequential model now we are adding the layers so model dot add layers dot con 2d which is a two dimensional convolutional layers and this 32 represents our filter so you also call this as kernels and these are kind of like uh, these 3 comma 3 is the shape that i'm mentioning so you have a 224 comma 224 image and on this image right this kernels or this filters kinds of scan through these images as a matrix of 3 comma 3 so there are some animations that you can look up for again we will understand more of this in detail in our deep learning course for now i'll just give you a eye level overview so you have a filter 32 filters and all these filters scan through these images in this 3 comma 3 matrix size and this as an activation function of relu so you have different activation functions of this sigmoid softmax relu and so on so for these layers relu is a uh, good activation functions that you have you also have other activation functions as well of course right so first is your filters and the ne next one is the shape of your filters activation function input shape input shape mention the size that you are working on so the size that i'm working on is 224 which is stored in this variable and three is the channel number of channel if you are working on grayscale you don't have to mention anything so that the model understood that understands that it is a grayscale image now but this is a rgb so i'm putting three and then we are adding max pooling layer so the work of this convolutional layer is to basically uh, kind of find the different features present in the image uh, that's what like basically happens here it kind of like uh, figures out where those edges are where those let's say some spots and all those things are and max pooling layer reduces the spatial dimensions your height and width of the image and that's why we are using this again later we will understand more about this in detail and i have another set of convolutional and max pooling layers so this is my first set and now i have this another set of convolutional and max pooling layers but i'm increasing this number of filters to 64 so it's not that you should always increase this kernels you can also have same numbers so the idea behind increasing that is as we kind of go into more deeper layers right so the model should be able to uh, 
find more complex features and for that we would need like more number of filters to scan through the image and, and kind of do the convolution operation and here also we are kind of uh, applying the activation relief functions and then again we have the max pooling layer so these are all our, our convolutional and max pooling layers in between you can probably also add this uh, dropout layers and other things as well but i mean for all those we can probably discuss later as well the next thing is we need to flatten this till now uh, the uh, the data that's flowing within it can be like a three dimensional array or two dimensional array but later this we are going into dense layers which are like the fully connected layers and these dense layers expect the data to be one dimensional as let's say a vector right so it shouldn't have a matrix kind of a shape but a vector which is like a single dimension so that will be done by this flattening operation where your data will be flattened to one dimension and, and then i have a, a dense layer uh, a deep layer with 256 neurons and i'm using activation function of relu so you can have a more number of dense layers as well you can again add some dropouts layer in between to make sure that your model is not overfitting your model is not like that complex and so on so what basically dropout will do is it will turn off some of the neurons in your uh, neural network so that's the purpose right and the next final uh, part is adding your top layer so top layer or this is your output layer where this this is the one that predicts the class of the image that you are working on so i'm calling this layers dot dense and the parameter that i'm using is train generator number underscore classes this basically returns you the number of classes that's present in your data set so probably i'll print and show this to you this should give 38 yeah so this is this output uh, layer basically should always contain the number of uh, classes that you have which is 38 right and the activation is softmax so softmax is a good uh, activation function that you can use whenever you are working with uh, you know this uh, multi-class problems whenever you are having a binary classification you can go with the sigmoid so sigmoid should probably work well in those cases right and what would happen is so we have 38 neurons in our output layer and each of this neuron would give you the probability that you know uh, image belonging to a particular class so think about it like this so we have 38 neuron and let's say the first neuron corresponds to the class that is apple being healthy and the next one is the apple having a black rod disease and so on so when you pass a prediction image each of this neuron would, would give you a probability and how we predicted is we get all the probabilities and see which neuron has given you the highest probability let's say the fifth neuron gave you the highest probability which is 0.65 and other neurons have uh, probabilities like 0 0.1 0 0.2 and so on right so let's say that it's the case now we say that fifth neuron is uh, the prediction that we got because that has a higher probability and now we look at the class names and let's say the fifth neuron corresponds to uh, let's say apple being healthy and we say that that is the class it belongs to so how, this is how this final output layer would work okay so this is where we are building the architecture for our model and you can always do this model dot summary in order to kind of understand or see how your model is connected and if you are kind of facing some errors this is actually like helpful for you in order to debug it and see like uh, how your architecture is looking like so uh, maybe i'll quickly give you again an over overview of how you can infer this uh, summary of the model so this is a sequential model so the first column that we have over here is the layers so each row corresponds to each individual layers that we have built over here so this is the first layer second layer and so on so that information will be present and this output shape is each uh, kind of layer would give you a tensor as the output right so that's what i've told you so that output shape will be uh, kind of represented here and the number of parameters in each of these uh, kind of layers is, is kind of given in this uh, basically in this third column of parameters so that's what you can see so this is the output of 2 triple 2 triple 2 comma 32 so all these are kind of depends this output of this convolutional layer right so this depends on the kernel that you have and uh, basically like the kernel size or the shape that you are mentioning so this is the output similarly the max pooling layer would again as i said this would reduce your spatial dimensions as you can see your uh, height and width have been kind of reduced by two right so this is how your 
kind of max pooling layer kind of works and you can see the difference over over here so you can use this in order to kind of see how your dimension or of your shapes of your matrices and tensors change as the data flows through the different layers of your neural network and finally in the dense layer right we have this 38 which is basically like you would uh, get a matrix with 38 uh, probability values and from that we can infer it and this basically shows you the total number of parameters and the trainable parameters out of which like how many parameters are trainable so if you are working with the transfer learning approach right so we can kind of freeze some of these layers some of these parameters so those won't be kind of adjusted only the uh, when, when you say trainable parameters right so when the model kind of trains it updates those parameter values that you have so that's the basic idea and uh, the other thing the none that you're seeing here is basically your batch size right so the num or the batch number basically so uh, we didn't give that batch information here yet so this says none which is which, which is basically that you can have any number of batch size so we are going with a different batch size so that will come into play only when we pass the data so that's why it says none and so on that's about it so the next step is compiling the neural network that we have built this is where we say that this is the optimizer that I want to use, which is Adam optimizer is one of the widely used ones. So it kind of uh, is based on like a couple of uh, good optimizers. And then we have loss function as categorical cross entropy, which is usually used when we have this one not encoded uh, labels. And when you pass this image to this data generator, right? So we would get one not encoded labels. And this is where we are using this loss function. And the metric on which it should train is accuracy is what we are saying so this this will like use accuracy as the metric when the training happens so i'll compile the model as well the next step is training it so we call this model dot fit right and we also have this storing this in a variable called as history so this history will basically kind of store all your loss training uh, sorry the loss accuracy and other uh, kind of uh, you know characteristics or things that you're getting throughout this training process so this will store this in history and later when we want to look at the performance of the model of your accuracies and your loss function changes we will use this history variable so that's the idea so we are calling this model dot fit now we need to pass our data so you call this train generator so this will pass your uh, training data along with those labels that it has created right so we are not like manually creating those labels processing these images so we have the pipeline which is train generator that we have created over here and we are passing that right and uh, then we have the steps per epoch steps per epoch is basically like how many batches that you have so if you see train generated dot sample is the number of uh, training images that you have when you divide it it by batch size so batch size is 32 that means one batch should contain 32 so when you divide it you would basically get the number of batches that you have so that's what we are passing to steps per epoch epoch is nothing but uh, let's say you have 10,000 images in your data so when your model kind of uh, goes through all of these 10,000 images and learn from it we call that as one epoch so in this case I'm having like five epochs so that means my model kind of uh, trains five times in the entire data set so that's what you call a epoch and each epoch we are kind of having a step which is basically the number of batches is what we are passing here and validation data we are passing the validation generator that which we have kind of created here right so that's our validation generator so the purpose of this again the validation step is like the number of patches that the validation data would contain so the idea is the parameters your models weights uh, will be adjusted based on this training data and once each epoch is done right we would evaluate our model with the training data as well as the validation data so this is because training data can be misleading so your model can perform well on the training data but it can like may not perform well on the validation of the test data so we could see at each epoch level to make sure that if a model is kind of starting to overfit in a particular epoch or it's kind of overfitting like throughout all the epochs and so on so it's always good to uh, kind of get the metrics and validation data as well so the other way would be to kind of with this within this training data itself you can separate a validation data but here we are going with a separate validation set so i'll run this so this will uh take like few minutes to run uh, if you want you can increase the epochs but make sure that your model is not overfitting so you can see the loss function decreasing and the accuracy value increasing loss is basically uh it's the difference between your predicted value and your true value 
so yeah uh, we want our last value to decrease and that will increase our accuracy value like that's the basic idea so you can see uh, the steps it's taking these are the steps that we have seen and we have this loss value you want accuracy value so once this one epoch is done right we would see the metric for validation data as well so this would take some time and in the meantime we can probably look into the other pieces of code as well so and then we have this model evaluation step again model evaluation we actually need to do a bit more than just comparing or just getting the accuracy on loss value so you can kind of plot a confusion matrix to see that if let's say two particular diseases are kind of being classified inappropriately it's like let's say apples black rot and potatoes black rot are kind of always uh, misclassified to understand that these two classes can be or these two diseases can be kind of like a bit similar when you kind of see the leaf of that image sorry the leaf of that plant right so those information we can get from confusion matrix and other metrics can also be helpful but for keeping things simple right so i'm just going with accuracy and loss value so i'm having this val loss validation loss and validation accuracy model dot evaluate and i'm passing my validation generator which will pass my validation data and its uh, labels and i'm again having this tips with this validation generator dot sample divided by back size and i'm printing my validation accuracy so let's run this as well and now in this case this is like a simple thing so we are plotting the accuracy uh you know curve as well as the loss curve for both training data and uh, the test data the first one is the accuracy curve for train and test and the second one is the loss curve so accuracy should increase in each epoch in, in an ideal case but we may not see that case as our model may not be ideal right and again loss should decrease as the epochs kind of go by so that's about it so you can infer it so here we can see the first epoch has been done and we are getting a loss value of 0 0.9 which is a decent thing and accuracy is 0 0.72 on training set validation losses i mean even lesser than the training loss and the validation accuracy is it's good 0 0.84 but this is i mean we can't say for sure if if it works really well just by looking at first epoch as well in the second case we are seeing that the accuracy is kind of increasing by a significant amount and what would generally happen is right uh you can again go with 10 epochs or even 20 epochs but your accuracy value may not increase by a significant amount so in this let's say our accuracy increased by 20 percentage so it can be a case where uh, your accuracy is 50 percentage in your first epoch it increases to let's say 80 percent in your second epoch and it increases to 95 percent in your or 90 percent in your third epoch so after that it, it's kind of not predicting well so your accuracy just kind of increases by one percentage or two percentage right so that often leads to overfitting and it's not like a good way to kind of work so in that case we follow a process called as early stopping where in the training itself if the model is not increasing its accuracy its performance by a significant amount right so the uh, model training will stop then and there even if you have 10 20 epochs right if the training process hasn't seen enough increase in the accuracy over let's say two or three epochs it will stop the training there so that's again a good thing that we can include in later videos yeah you can probably do some research on that as well so the other uh, thing that we need to note here is neural network often tend to overfit because of the complexity of the model and if you are using a simple data set as this plant images there is a chance that it can overfit so you may need to kind of see how you can process the data better again adding augmentation to this or keeping your model uh, kind of like more simpler adding the dropout rates you can basically do a lot of those things or you can also try some hyper param tuning and so on okay so that's other thing so till now see it's on the third epoch maybe let's go through the other pieces of the code as well so now we would have trained our model once all these epochs are done and we would have this model where we would pass a test image and predict it right and here i have two functions so when you pass a new image this should also be processed processed in the same way that your train data and your validation data has been processed so for that i'm writing this function so i have this load and process image function and a predict image class function so uh, in this load and pre-process image right so we pass the path of the image so basically what probably can do is i'll uh, i can like upload an image and copy these three test images that i have I mean it can predict correctly or it can predict wrongly both things can happen so we can't be sure that if, if our model is pretty good 
it should have a good accuracy on training and test but if not we probably can see like some misclassification but yeah that's okay for now uh yeah you probably have this test apple black rod so maybe you can take this example around for now so i have this load and pre-process image image path target size so the reason is we need to resize the image right so the training data image that we have taken as the size of 224 224 which we have resized so the new image that we are predicting we don't know what's the shape of the image that the user want to predict so we need to make sure that once they upload an image we are kind of resizing it and making it like kind of suitable for the model to kind of predict from it so we have this image dot open from pillow library so we have imported this image class from pillow uh, pill library and and we are opening this image and resizing this with the target size here the target size is 224 comma 224 so this will resize it and we are con converting it to a numpy array which is like the better suited data uh, type for the neural network to predict and then adding the batch dimension right so even if we are predicting uh, for a single image the model requires or needs the data in in the kind of a batch so this is like saying that i have single image or it's like a, i have a batch that has a single image so this your model would give you the prediction for that particular batch right and that's what happens in this like uh, expand dimensions thing and then we also shouldn't forget that we need to resize our model with 255 right to make sure that the rescaling happens so that's what we are doing again the same normalization that we have done if you normalize your training data and your validation data if you're not resizing your test data it's like the model doesn't understand it so it should probably give you a prediction but your prediction may not be accurate so make sure that you are doing that normalization in your uh kind of pre-processing things as well so i've also added comments required comments uh in these functions as well you can note it down the only thing is just making sure that it's in the floating data type so we are converting it to floating type and dividing it with the floating alias 255 and uh if, if you can kind of do this without this make sure you can just try this to see if this is required or you can probably remove this and try as well so i got some issues so i have added this conversion factor and finally we are predicting it so once we have processed this image now it's suitable uh, for us in order to pass this to the model and get a prediction out of this so we have this uh, this is the function that we will be calling and we will pass the model the image path and the class indices class indices is again your model would just give you the prediction output in probabilities from this we would get the index as 0 1 2 or all the way up to 37 so you would have from 0 to 37 but we need the class names whether it's apple black rod or it's blueberry lt and so on right so that class names we can get from this train generator dot class indices dot items so you have this uh, train generator uh, class indices dot items right so you're, you're basically i'm creating a dictionary that has a key value pair where your uh, key will be 0 to 37 and your value would be that class name the name that you are seeing over here in uh, in this you know folder names i'll probably also print and show it to you once the training has been done right so once we get the prediction we pass that uh integer values over here and get the class name so that's why we have this class indices so this predict image class function requires the model as first parameter image path as a second parameter and the class indices that we have over here as a third parameter so we are creating a variable as pre called as pre-processed image and calling the function load and pre-process image so we are passing the raw image that the user has uploaded the path of the image and this load and pre-process will make sure that the image is properly kind of pre-processed for the model to predict and then we call this model dot predict on this pre-process image and we get the predictions now the prediction that the model is giving you is again as i said it would give you the probability value the probability uh, value of the image belonging to all those 38 classes so you would have 38 probability values and we need to see out of these 38 values uh, which has the highest probability and this np.argmax will basically return you the index of the highest probability value again that five example that i've told you right so you have uh, let's say 38 uh, probability values and the probability value in the fifth index is the highest value which is let's say 0.65 now we put that uh, index value of 5 in this class indices that's what we are doing here and get the name so that name is that those subdirectory name the class names that we have and this will return that name and then later we can print it so that's what we are doing in this function so I'm also kind of storing this json.dump so you need to save the model as well as this uh, class indices so that we can use this in our streamlit web app in order to 
kind of predict and show the class name to the user so once all these are done right so we have uploaded the image uh probably i'll uncomment the one that has this apple black rot test apple back black rot here yeah, that's the name that i have over here again this may be a wrong prediction but let's see how this is working so the model has trained let's go back here and look at this so the training accuracy has increased and it has not increased after like the third epoch so it stopped at 97 so i'm just having like lesser number of epochs so you can go with higher number and see if the validation accuracy is also increasing so you can see validation accuracy doesn't loss doesn't change accuracy also doesn't change much so we can basically improve our model this is like i would say this is not overfitting but there is like a very slight overfitting issue but we can again augment the data pre-process it better and we can have like a better model architecture in order to solve this but for now this is okay so let's see how we can use this model and get a prediction because validation accuracy should be the same as this one right because this is the accuracy of the model on the validation set after the fifth epoch and that would be our final epoch so that's why you're getting like the same values over here so we are printing the percentage value and then we are printing the curve you can see the accuracy of training started with about 72 and it increased it after that it, it has like a decent increase but test accuracy doesn't increase that much so that's how that's why you're getting this kind of a curve again this would be this loss would be slightly inverted to this so your loss should decrease because your decrease in loss would increase your accuracy so what you're seeing is basically like the opposite of the curve that you're seeing for accuracy so we have this blue line for training and the orange line for testing so this is like pretty easy to infer so don't think much complex about it and then we also have a predictive system code i'll run this and i'll also run this class in this this is what i have been telling you so we have a key value pair zero and uh, the key of i mean the key is zero here and the value is apple underscore apple scab thing and we have the index and, index and the corresponding class name right so i'll run this in order to save this class indices as json so this would have been saved here you can uh, download this so this is very important so you need this json file uh, in order to get your prediction i'll open it and other interesting thing here is this is something that we need to note if you see the index that we are seeing over here is in the form of integer but once i have downloaded the json i'm getting it as a string you can make sure that the processing happens properly uh, but what to what this would create an issue what would happen is when you are passing this index right when you are passing 0 or 1 so when you call np.argmax this would pass an integer value index value here but when you put that on a streamlit app the index is actually a string so what we have to do is we have to convert this uh, integer np.argmax into string and basically predict it but let me not make things complex so i'll tell you about it when we have the streamlit tab so that's the idea the difference is uh, once your dictionary has been saved the key values are getting converted to string so that is something we need to handle later so that's one thing okay so we have saved this uh, class indices.json file with the same json library with the dumb function we're passing uh, the uh, dictionary and opening a file called as class indices.json and writing it now let's pass this image and get a prediction and Hopefully this should tell me that this is an apple black rot image. Oh, this says the image is not there. Probably the path is wrong. Okay, it says JPG in caps. We'll copy this and paste it over here. Yeah, it says apple black rot, which is the correct prediction. So again, this may work uh, correctly for some of the images and some of the images may not give you the correct prediction. Again, for that, we need to improve our model, have a better data processing strategy and so on. All this again, it's, we, it's, it's not easy to cover all those things in a single video, right? So as I make more videos, I'll try to add each of these individual more advanced things so that it's not heavy for you to understand as well so that's about uh, building this model and next you can save your model with this model.save and uh, you have this plan this is prediction.h5 the other uh, thing that's hard to work on google collaboratory is right when you save the model without i mean if you don't save it in your drive if you try to you know maybe i'll uh, run this but yeah i'll copy this this is like basically saving my uh, model in my google drive but if i do this by saving it in my default working directory which is this space this will i mean save the model quickly but when you download it it will take a very long time so i would suggest you 
to connect your google drive from here so you can mount your google drive by kind of clicking it and you will kind of i think it will ask for connecting the google drive you can do that or it will kind of show you this cell right you can run this in order to give your credential and save your model so from your drive you can quickly download the file so that's the thing that i would prefer so this is the path in my drive that i'm kind of using if you want to get this particular path that you are working on right so once you have mounted it i'm sure you know this but if you are not sure about it i'll explain you so once you have mount your uh, google drive you will see a folder called as drive so you can navigate through your drive and create a folder and save wherever you want so i've, I've already saved my file in my google drive so i'm not going to run this but if you are want to save this file i would suggest you not to do this because as i said it would take a very long time for you to download your model so save it in drive and then get it so that's about it so now what we have done is we have trained our model process images trained our model and this is the model dot hp file is the one that we are interested in now i'll open my pycharm where i have the code for my streamlet app i'll stop this previous streamlet app that i run to show you the demo right so uh, you can probably use the same code structure so this is my working directory and then i have this app directory where my streamlet app is present called as main.py file all these other files i have for dockerizing this but all these things we can see later the important things that you need to see are this requirements file which has this numpy streamlet and tensorflow so you need to install all these libraries probably use the same versions to make sure that it's not throwing you some errors main.py file which has the code for your streamlet app and trained model is the folder present in the same directory as this main.py so we have this uh, app folder in your project directory you have this uh, within that you have a trained model which has this plant disease prediction model dot file and then you have this main.py file where we will be loading this class indices as well as our uh, where is this yeah so our model as well so make sure that you are putting your class index index file and your uh, model file in the same directory so i have given all those things in my repository i'll share this repository with you as well so you can use that class indices dot json and uh, yeah class indices and the train model so again i couldn't upload this model in git because it was like a larger file so i have given you a text what you can do is you can either train your own model in the google collab or i have given the model link of the model that i have trained so you can go to this link uh, download this model and then you can kind of put it in this trained model folder and run it if you just clone this repository and run it it won't run because this actually doesn't have the model file so it just have the link i've also given that link in the readme file so you can download it from here for your convenience but i would suggest you to run your own collab and Kind of get the model from there instead of using the one that i'm providing you so that's about it so this is our main.py file maybe now we can understand the code for it so i'm importing all the required libraries os json pillow numpy tensorflow streamlet so here i'm changing the working uh, or, or basically storing the working directory uh, in a variable called as this thing because when you run a streamlet app uh, the working directory may change to your uh, you know the pc's user directory so to make sure that you kind of say that this is the directory that you should look at so i mean in this case it may not be important but i would suggest you to always use this whenever you are using streamlet because when you call a file right so here if you see i'm calling this working directory so when i run the streamlet app if i just say train model plant disease detection uh, plant disease prediction model it won't look at this app because as i said the working directory would have changed so when you pass this working directory what this line basically does is uh, it gets the absolute path of the file the, in this case the file is nothing but main.py so it gets the path of the file and it stores over here so it's like copying the entire path of the model file and it pasting it there so instead of hard coding it i'm getting it from the python file itself so it's just similar to going here copying the entire uh, path of this train model thing and pasting it here but that's not the ideal way because if you are working on it right now you need to go to the code change the directory according to your pc folder structure and so on so instead we can just get the absolute path from this file itself by calling this uh, kind of function and getting it and then passing it to your trained model class index model and so on so that's the idea so here we are calling this working directory 
giving the model path and now we are loading this model with tensorflow.keras.models.load model and then we are uh, loading this class index class indices json file to this dictionary and then we have we have the same functions that we have seen in the google collaboratory the only thing that's different over here is so once we find this np.argmax i'm converting this integers to string the index to string because as we know that the index have been changed to strings probably you can work on some methods to retain the values as integers so yeah nothing wrong in that so we have those two functions uh, again the same functions that we have seen here so i'm not going to explain those now is the streamlit abstracture so i'm uh, creating the title as plant disease classifier and i'm creating an upload tab with st.file upload and the type that we can approve our jpg image jpeg and png images if uploaded file is not known so this will appear in the web app only if the file has been uploaded right so once the file has been uploaded this uploaded image won't be having a none so when the uploaded image is not none this will run so we will open the image and we have these two columns to display just, just you can do this without these columns but this is just to organize the web app in a more in a better way so in the first column we are resizing the image to 150 comma 150 again we are not passing this this is just to display we are kind of resizing this to 150 comma 150 so don't confuse it with the 224 and 224 resizing that we do that we do in this particular function this is just to display the image this resized image won't be used anywhere instead just for uh, displaying it we'll be using this and then we have the second column uh, where we have this classify button and then here we call this predict image class that also has this load and pre-process image function so we process the image and get a prediction out of this so while predicting this we need to pass the model uploaded image so instead of path right uh, once you have loaded this in below you can also pass this uploaded image so that will like take care of that and you pass the class indices in order to get the name of the index and finally we say st.success so when you put st.success it will create a green bar and it will print the prediction there so that's about it now let's see how we can run our streamlit app <clears throat> and in pycharm you can use in order to access your terminals and it's a better IDE for debugging purpose as well. So my default working directory is this Jan25 thing. And uh, but my main.py file is present within this app, right? So what you can do is either, uh, I mean, first step, probably you can do this pip install to make sure that NumPy, Streamlit and TensorFlow that I mentioned here are kind of installed in the proper library version. So for that, you can do pip install. Uh, app slash requirements.txt because my txt file is within this app folder right because this is required for building the docker image as well so that's why i have this in this instead of having this in the project directory so this will install numpy streamlet and the other things so i've already installed it so it's that's what it's saying here and the next step is we need to run our streamlet app for that you can say streamlet run app slash main.py or the other way is you can kind of do a cd space app this will take you to that particular directory now you can just say streamlet run just main.py because we are within this uh, app directory so that you can kind of work upon properly so i'll delete this and clear this and I'll come out of this app so i'll for now i'll just come out of it and just run this streamlet run uh app slash main dot py so this should open or yeah open my browser and show the streamlet app where we can upload the image and get a prediction so here i can go ahead and browse the files and uh, i'll upload this test apple black dot jpg so if you see this this is the two columns that i mentioned so the image that we are representing in this left hand side are column one and this class is present in the uh, right side just our column two so that's why we have this column one and column two thing if you don't do this this class way will be in the bottom of this image but even that's okay right so that's not a big deal so i'll click this classify and this should give this st dot success in a green bar and it should say the prediction which is a black rod you can this is just for reference to make sure for us to understand right if the model is predicted correctly i've renamed this but yeah you can probably download the some images from this uh, color folder and, and probably see like 
how this is predicting again if you have trained a grayscale image you should use a grayscale image i'm sure that you already know this just pointing this out if you are using a colored image make sure that you are using that and probably I'll test this potato early blight and see if this is classifying correctly again i've tested a few images it was like not predicting correctly so again we need to improve our model so that i'll kind of leave it to you as an exercise that you can do but yeah for these we are getting like proper predictions so this is how you can build your streamlet app and now we are in the final step of deploying this in a more standard way where uh, we will be kind of uh, dockerizing the streamlet app and building docker containers out of this so i'll stop this and clear all these things so for that what we need is a docker file so docker file is basically a file that contains all the instructions or commands in order to uh, build the docker image so once you have built the docker image right so it's like a template you can create the instance of this docker image which is your docker container that has all the dependencies like python all the libraries and all this main py file the train model files and so on so you have all these things in a docker container and then you run it as a docker container as as a package so that you don't have to worry about like another person having a different library version different python version and so on so you can also deploy these docker containers and docker images easily in cloud platforms like azure and aws so these are like other advantages to this right so that's yeah that's the good thing about deploying this as a docker so that's what we'll be doing now so we won't be going into cloud aspects of this i'll just show you how you can build a docker image out of this and build docker containers from this so this streamlet app has been closed so i'll close this for now again this config.2ml and credentials.2ml i have given this in my github repository itself the same code structure you can use this these are some default files that the streamlet app needs so you can just kind of have this let's quickly go through this docker file so i've also made uh, videos recently on uh, i mean what are these docker files what are these commands mean and so on so if you want a detailed video please refer to that one where i've explain like how you can deploy streamlet app as docker containers here i'll just give you a quick uh, overview of this so first we are setting up the python version python 3.10 slim and we are copying all the contents to the folder called as app so this is like a tricky thing so when i say copy dot it's the directory where my docker file is situated so when i say copy space dot it will copy all the files present in the directory where my docker file is situated in other words in this case it will copy the trained model folder class indices file all these things and it's it will store in a folder called as app so this app folder is not the same as this one this app folder is the one that's present in your docker image and your docker container so basically we are copying all this uh, contents present in our local in this working directory to the one that's present in the docker image that we are building and in within this docker container we are kind of changing the working directory to slash app where uh, uh, you know all our uh, code files and required config and credential files are present you don't have to change anything in this files you can just use the standard one that i've given you and then we run this pip install r requirements or txt command so here you don't need to put slash app because the working directory would be this app and that would contain this requirement.txt so you don't have to change anything on this docker files next is that this is uh, saying like which port the docker container should run so we are saying expose 80 so on this particular port our uh, docker container which is basically the streamlet app will be running and then we are creating a folder called as dot streamlet uh, this make directory and copying this uh, config.2ml and credentials.2ml to the stream dot streamlet folder so these are like standard things that you need to do with these files and finally I'm putting these commands which are streamlet run main.py the same commands that we have run so these are the commands that should run when we kind of run our docker container and we build our docker image so that's what we will do in order to do this make sure you navigate to the folder where your docker is present and the other requirement prerequisite for it for this is right so make sure that you have installed a docker again i'm on linux so i have installed docker again if you are also installed working on linux you can uh install it from the terminal and access docker from terminal you can do the same in windows but in windows you also have a graphic user interface for docker called as docker desktop so you need to go there and start your docker engine before doing this and 
in Linux, right, you can also do this by starting the Docker with sudo systemctl space start Docker. But for my system, it's kind of whenever I start my PC, it's uh, kind of starting by default. So I'm not doing that. But if if you are facing some issue saying that the Docker daemon or something, it's it's not started. You can run that command. You can find that online as well. It's no big deal. So once we have all those things, now I'm in this Jan 25 code prep directory i need to navigate to this app directory so here i'll say cd space app now in the, i'm in this app where my docker file is situated so i'm now i'm going to build this i'll say sudo and the other important thing is uh if you're working on linux run sudo commands so we need to run this as administrator and if you are working on windows make sure you are running pycharm as administrators so here i'll say sudo docker build so we are going to tag it with a name i'll call this as plant this is prediction image so this and space dot oh okay i can also give a tag saying that this is let's say v1.0 this is like usual standard naming convention that we use which is like let's say this is the version that we are working on and space dot again dot is the uh, home directory so when you say dot it it expects that docker file is present in this app directory so that's why we say this dot similarly what we have over here so if you have a subfolder within this app and there you have this docker file make sure that you are mentioning that uh, folder here this dot is like really important so we say sudo docker build iphone t plan this is prediction image so this will build my docker image i have to put my password as i'm running the command as administrator so you can see all these commands will be running first it will install python copy the contents working directory all those things will be happening so you can see python 3.10 is getting installed and it's copying the files and it's changing the working directory and it's running the pip install command this should take few seconds okay and then yeah we would have this uh yeah so once this has been done right we would uh build the docker container from this image so again this is the usual analogy that I have been using in my previous videos i'll probably use this in this video as well so you can think about this docker file as let's say the template in order to build the docker image right or you can think about this as like the plan and the steps that you need in order to uh, let's say build a car or let's say a car manufacturing plant our end goal is to manufacture a car but for that you need an infrastructure which is your plant that manufactured it right your car manufacturing plant you can think about your docker image as this manufacturing plant and you have the steps in the docker file and the docker containers are like the final cars that we are building so you have a plan of action which is your docker file and you have the infrastructure to do that but you have uh, your manufacturing plan like similarly you have your python all the required libraries and so on and finally you can build any number of cars from your plan similarly you can build any number of containers from your image so images are nothing sorry the containers are nothing but the individual instance of the container that you are creating so that's how you can probably understand dockers and this docker containers and so on again the other advantage is that you can deploy these easily in cloud services like aws or azure and uh, I've also uploaded a video on how you can deploy Docker containers as Azure container instance. So that may not work in this case because uh, it, it would be better if you have a GPU uh, instance in Azure, but container instance doesn't give you. So you probably need to deploy it with Azure Kubernetes service, but that's going to cost you a lot. I'll probably upload a video on a uh, you know, better way to kind of deploy the deep learning models on Azure and probably AWS at a later time. But yeah, this is something that you can keep in our mind. So yeah, I think uh, Docker images completed building. Now you can check the Docker images present in your systems with this sudo Docker images. This is the one 30 seconds, 33 seconds ago. So this is the image that I built, plan disease prediction image v1.0. So now I'm going to run this doc, create this Docker container. So I'll call this sudo docker run iphone p. So make sure that you use this thing, iphone p 80 is to 80, which is just mapping the port that we have, which is 80 colon 80 and give the image name. So you can either copy and paste this image ID or you can copy this, uh, image name along with the tag which is this v1.0 that you are seeing here v1.0 
sudo docker run iphone p port 80 to 80 this one so this should give us a link a command not found oh, made a typo so i'll correct this one sudo docker run p80 this is the port that it's running again i've tested this on windows so windows this port is not working so you can just go to local host and on local host this would work and probably after local host you can try 80 so i'm not very sure but you can try it and let me know in the comments so but linux and mac this url would work this is the 80 port that we did but again windows just go to just type local host and see if this is opening so here we have the same streamlit app the only difference is we are not running it as a main.py file but we are running this as a docker container so i'll go ahead browse this apple black rot image thing and yeah so it's displaying now i'll classify this and this is working as expected so this is how you can build a docker image out of this and deploy this as a docker container so i can kind of uh, stop this by control c and you can see the list of currently running images by running the sudo docker ps you can see nothing is running if you want to also see the stopped docker containers you can see sudo docker uh, uh, ps iphone a this will show the ones that have also been like stopped this is the one that has been stopped 16 seconds ago and if i want to delete it what i can do is i can again you can delete this individually but if you have a bunch of containers you want to delete at once you can say sudo docker container room will ask for confirmation and say yes and again you can see the list of docker images that you have so i'll say sudo docker images my image is still there so i can if i want i can create another docker uh, container out of this and see you can see it's a pretty large image if you want to delete it you can just run the command sudo docker rmi and image id sometimes you need to do a force delete so for that you can do a, a iphone if i can probably paste a image id or complete image name with the tag so this will be deleted you can again run the sudo docker images to see if it's there so this is how you can build a streamlit app and deploy it on docker uh yeah so that's it from my side i hope everyone understood what we have done so please make sure that you have tested and you have like practiced all this code so this probably would be helpful for you if you're working on some other use case so that's it from my side and i'll see you in the next upload thanks for watching